Hi, well, thanks for coming. There's a lot of people <laughs> suddenly in the room. Um, yeah, because I've more or less spent the last uh, seven weeks uh, painting these paintings uh, pretty much every day, all day, for seven weeks. And one of the paintings from this series has already gone. So somehow or other, well, I can't quite work out how, and there wasn't anyone here to witness it. I mean, occasionally Alexandra would come and occasionally Chris would come to ask me something. I think I must have painted these <laughs> in this time, but I can't quite remember doing it or how I did it. But anyway, so um, there are three bodies of work in the room, actually. There's um, this set of uh, eight by six uh, street sellers, uh, for a show that's now s slightly moved, it, it was going to be in March 2024, 20, but now it's going to be in May 2024. And altogether there'll be 10 of these. So luckily, because of the space and the light and the, just the fact that it's a great place to be, six of the 10 paintings are... That one at the end, is, I've still got to do some things, quite a few things with it, but, you know, more or less done and it was a I don't know it's incredibly intense really um, every time which wasn't very often which is a good thing I hasten to add every time Chris or, or Alexandra came around they said oh my god you'll you'll need to get some more canvases because you're doing this so fast but I kind of tend to paint very fast to start with and then finishing is very slow so we're kind of in this set of works as sort of a process of understanding the place that these people are in, the, the kind of uh, who they are, finding them, talking to them, deciding what they're selling, why they're selling it, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, and what they're saying, you know, because uh, the point about performing, if you like, is that you're saying one thing, you're thinking another thing and you're feeling another thing all at the same time. Um, so these street sellers, the, the one that's gone, uh, that um, the director of uh, Green Naftali um, taken already, um, was a fish seller. So to some degree, you, you, you could have all looked at that and decided whether I could paint fish or not. Because <laughs> there's always something I'm trying to do in this set, set of painting. I, mean, I, I think what I do is not very radical. You know, I'm not, I, I come from a um, sort of theatre design background in, a, um, in that, uh, and a long time ago, you know, I was at art school in the mid-70s and then at the Royal College writing in the early 80s. So, and I don't consider myself a very radical painter, but what I'm artist, but what I'm always trying to do is kind of challenge myself to do something that I wasn't sure I could do. So for many years I, I painted, I wanted to paint a a lot of black people in the same canvas, in the same place at the same time, because there was not much of a tradition of painting black figures, but certainly, mostly, uh, you would only see in like Hogarth's work, maybe um, um, one black figure. He, he kind of introduced me to the idea that, that, that there weren't in many paintings with two black people. And the point about two black people as opposed to one is that there's an unspoken conversation goes on. Um, as well as a real conversation, but there's always an unspoken conversation in those sort of rather grand interiors of, um, of Hogarth engravings and paintings. Um, but in, in this set of work, um, I'm thinking about buying and selling, of course, um, in terms of that, that sort of uh, conversation I'm always having about the buying and selling of people. But in this particular case, the people are selling something. Um, they're shouting many of the uh, street cries of the, um, 
street sellers of London in the uh, 18th century. Um, but you won't find these people in those in engravings. You know, there are, you'll, you'll find the basket sellers, um, probably perfume sellers, chicken sellers, um, Joseph Clark, the posture master, the toy seller. You, you find all those people in those, in those engravings. But these people are another version, a version that didn't get recorded. So the chicken seller um, has cages for chickens, but no bars on the cages and no chickens. Um, this man here selling shells and ribbons has a false hand that's holding the ribbons. Uh, the basket seller uh, is kind of by the sea, but it's not really the sea. And I have to say, one of the things about painting in this studio, which is a great relief to me, which is completely different from when I was painting in the lifeguard's hut in the late 90s, when I was in the lifeguard's hut painting, I was actually painting the sea. You know, that was the whole sort of point for a series of work called uh, Plan B that was at, um, o o on exhibition in the late at the end of 1999 and the beginning of 2000. And when I'm in a studio where you can see the sea, then all I, I'm doing is looking at the sea, the whole time painting the sea. So I'm, if, I, if it's there, out of the window, then I have to just make some things that are about that lilac, up against that cobalt blue, up against that Naples yellow, blah, 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 blah. And it's become sort of obsessive. Uh, and so the great thing about painting in, in, in this studio is that I can hear it, I can go out and look at it, but I, I'm not so tempted to paint it. Nonetheless, <laughs> it appears every now and again against my better judgment. Uh, so those, that's one body of work, which um, I think w w the thing I haven't managed to do here, because I, I, I didn't have time and also want to do it in a different sort of way, is that there are text pieces that go with this uh, set of work, which will be a series of um, paintings and screen prints, painting with screen print on the top, which is sort of continuation of a, a project I did for uh, Christia Roberts just recently with um, uh, Magda Stavaska. And sometimes I'm working with her in collaboration, um, but mostly on either print pieces, like we're working together and she's the master printmaker on the, on the project, or uh, with sound, uh, uh, with her sound compositions. In the show at Tate Modern, which was from November 21 to about October 22, there were sound all the way through the exhibition, different compositions of hers that um, were made to go with uh, various uh, pieces that, that, that I made. So our, one of our collaborations was um, the Blue Grid Test. Um, and another one um, was a, a sound uh, piece that went with, um, a piece that I made here in 2019 called um, Old Boat, New Money, which are 32 um, wooden planks, uh, 15 foot tall. Um, and I could really only make them in this studio because I couldn't make them in my studio at home because it just isn't high enough and there isn't enough light in my studio at home, either of them, because they're both in Preston in the north of England where the days are short and the days are dark, even in the summer. <laughs> Um, and when she was uh, here with me, she was out in boats recording the sea or getting uh, me and other people to uh, move about on this floor so that the, it creaked. Um, so in the end, we got this sound of a kind of boat adrift, a big 17th century boat, wooden boat adrift, but she was picking up all the sounds from round here. It was made here, painted here, and, and soundtracked here, if you like. So we were 
we took that piece to New York, to the New Museum, so, and then it was in Tate Modern, uh, and then in Lausanne. So that sort of Portsmouth Studios has sort of gone with us all, you know, over, over many years. And um, then um, there was another sound piece uh, that, that she composed, which went with another series of paintings that I made here, um, in, in that period, uh, a piece called um, Metal Handkerchiefs, which were kind of uh, quite small paintings on uh, zinc um, that were image and text, border and field, if you like, and all the texts were taken from health and safety manuals, which you would think, especially if they're part of your job, are fantastically boring but if you read them because you're looking for poetry and everything you can find just the most beautiful beautiful phrases um, and so the texts were from those the paintings were about ob objects that you use to make things and the soundtrack was me talking uh, speaking those texts but she recorded it in this room and so you can, uh, on binaural microphones, so you can hear me whispering in her ear, but you can also hear me shouting across the room. So that whole sound piece too is evoking this space for us constantly. Anyway, when I got back here this time, as I say, I had three bodies of work I wanted to work on at once. And there's this bizarre thing in this room, if you've worked in this room, you can actually work on three bodies of work because although, you know, now that it's out, it looks like, well, it takes up a lot of space, but um, you can kind of, somehow I think because of the air above, you can, or I can, separate one set of work from another so that this set of work there are 10 of these i made about four already um which is for a different show somehow didn't they didn't interfere they could they could live alongside these well, I was, even though i was making all three sets of work at the same time and I, I put it here especially for chris because he likes to be able to see i think he likes to be able to see if anyone's doing anything you know so i thought okay put a bit of orange here and he'll think i'm working so it's, it's okay but he can see this painting across uh across the courtyard and through but um so there'll be about 10, 10 of these and these are these and those planks that you see around are for a show in Austin in Texas and um, I'm making a series of work in which there are always two or three people they're always round various tables and they're all engaged in at least two things at once because of course we're all engaged in more than two things at once sometimes quite difficult to paint more than two things at once so they call, they call it the minute in my mind, the strategy paintings. And always the people are engaged in a kind of rather odd and um, sometimes confrontative, but sometimes um, questioning and questionable, sometimes relationship with each other. Um, and also what they're doing at the same time is trying to work out some big issues. Um, big issues about heroism, about um, the environment, about balance, about love, about all kinds of things. And they use each set, each one of these paintings has a set of objects on the table and it's clear that they either have been moving them around or are in the process of moving them around in order to visualise the strategy or the discussion that's going on. So these three are mostly thinking about war, um, but, they, but there are kind of hints of those photographs of um, rather neat women in, uh, in the war cabinet rooms um, uh, 
sort of moving battleships around from you know, one side of the Atlantic Ocean to another. And you, can, and you can hear some, you know, fantastically beribboned general saying, you know, move the third fleet into the Baltic or whatever it is. So that person is kind of in the process of moving one object from one place to another place. Uh, one part of this kind of seascapey thing uh, to another place. And each of the... Um, Objects are. Uh, um, I have this fantastic book, uh, which is a Russian archive, a book of a, a Russian archive of um, broken and mended objects. So those two things, the kind of conical thing and the tin can thing, are both fish feeders made from bits of old rubbish that these guys had around. Um, to help them go fishing. Um, um, so I'm often using objects that suggest something else, objects that I like to um, paint because they're difficult or sometimes because they're easy. Um, the other paintings in this series, one has a table with three people and the objects are tiny um, toy soldiers, uh, but of various regiments over sort of 500 years. Um, and that painting is all about what, what, what is heroism for? What's a hero? What's the point of that? Um, and then there's another one where three men are kind of in, not so much in conflict, one is just very bored, um, and the other two are rather more concerned, and they have a lot of spinning tops and gyroscopes on the table, and they're trying to sort of work out how, what balance is. What does it mean? How does it work? What does it do? Um, and then in, in another one, uh, there are, at the moment, two, uh, and that one's in the studio at home, sort of half finished before I came here, two people... Uh, mapping stars and uh, I'm trying to paint an orrery which of course is a great idea but then you start to try and paint is quite difficult so it was a great excuse to come here and not and leave it and wait till I get back um, so that's like the second uh, body of work but as I say because I can paint these very easily in my two studios in Preston and the it, it was much more difficult to get a kind of sense of how these would be together in a gallery. It seemed very sensible to paint a, a good a good part of these. So to be able to have painted six of these at once and only have four more to kind of do seemed sensible uh, here to do it here. And then the third uh, set of set of work is a set of work called Aunties, and um, I. This is also for Austin, but on a different, uh, a different floor of the, of the gallery. Um, the gallery is called Contemporary Austin. And um, uh, the, it's one of those you know, little white cube spaces that thinks it's a white cube, but it isn't. It's sort of really peculiarly constructed. It used to be a shop. It's been a cinema. You know, shop, I mean, sort of department story type of shop. Um, and the ceilings, both on the uh, ground floor, uh, the, the ceiling is corrugated iron, which is where these will be. And the ceiling on the upper floor is um, wooden beams. And so there are white walls really high, and then there's this kind of great circus of wooden beams. And it seemed to me that I wanted to make a piece that... Uh, connected to that ceiling, really. How am I doing? Yeah, that connected to that ceiling, really, and uh, made you want to, made you think in a sort of some kind of way that these artworks were actually taken, beams taken from the ceiling and then used in a different way. Um, and I had this idea to. Mm, make these planks for my studio team to make these planks um, out of all the bits of wood that we have in the in the studio in the workshops 
in the you know, garage, in the cellar, everywhere. Just, come on, let's not cut down another set of trees to make this artwork. So there'll be 64 of these, and each one of them are, uh, I think, it's hard to know. Uh, I think uh, some will be much more painted than this, and some much less. So they're made of everything that we had. You know, there are doors there, bits of bed there, um, everything. And um, this was the first time they had made this kind of thing, because I said, I want them to have some sort of fancy-looking joints. Um, and so anyway, they went ahead with fancy-looking joints, and no sooner had I been here and started working on them that some of them fell apart. So on the floor behind you there are lots of broken pieces of things. So I, I texted them and I said, oh, you know those things you just made me? They're broken. So I sent them photographs of how they were broken and whatever, and they, they, they said they'll take them to A&E when they, when they come back, um, but they've they've kind of worked out some better methods now. So we're always trying to, we're trying to do something that we hadn't done before. And, um, and yeah, they're called aunties um, because it seems to me that aunties are kind of special in, in a different sort of way. Um, not necessarily the relatives of your parents, but Sometimes women that come in and out of your house, or uh, the sis sometimes the sisters of your father, or or friends of your mother's, or just people who treat you slightly differently, um, and either for better or worse, you know. But uh, I kind of think of my auntie was a violin player and and very bossy and very strict, but also and taught me to read but also the sort of person who would let me eat ice cream in the street, <laughs> and which my mother never would. <laughs> it's like, no, you can't do it because you'll spill it over what you're wearing, and then where will we be? So, so I have kept that kind of uh, vibe going on here. And what I realised in here, which I don't think I could have understood unless I'd had this kind of space, was that because I planned to show them um, like 30 of them all in a row, but kind of high up on this white wall, and then 30, 30 of two of them, and then 32 of them on the other side of this gallery, kind of sliding down the wall. So they were kind of at a slope like this. But and it was, I seemed okay, and I was working them, you know, like you have to work on them individually and flat. And then I was putting them up and putting them in rows, and I was thinking, well, it either means I have to do more to these or less to these, so that was useful. And then I started to stack them, mostly, I have to say, because stacking them like that, mostly because um, just, I was just being kind of tidy in a funny sort of way. Um, and I realised, of course, that Aunties are kind of often not alone, that's sort of not the point, and that they work best in these clusters of four and clusters of five. And I think that I might change the whole kind of uh, formation of how I was going to do this because I've sort of understood that they work much better where four or five of them or three or four of them are in conversation with each other as well as in conversation with you. And it's not something I could have done or tried or predicted or prioritised in my studio at home because my studio at home is not tall enough, which is another reason why I brought this set of work here, even though it doesn't need to be done till March, because I needed to sort of try it. I think it's like a rehearsal room, this space, a rehearsal room for how a show can work and a rehearsal room for how to get kind of very familiar with your paintings um, and how they get familiar with each other. Behind there are some uh, men in drawers, um, which I brought along a couple of drawers because I thought, well, I've, I've got any time, I might, I might paint them. Uh, but 
sometimes it just doesn't come, you know, for months and months and months. I, I think, you know, I, uh, it's not, it's not going to happen, it doesn't matter. They're not for anything. I just paint them when I come across a, a drawer or I see a chest of drawers somewhere that I, you know, from a charity shop or whatever, and I buy it and take the drawers out. Um, but anyway, one and a half of them appeared this time. Um, kind of, which I, I'm happy about because it's kind of nice to to be able to, uh, yeah, just to have that happen. I think it, though that making of the drawers is very much something that happens when I'm feeling incredibly kind of relaxed about what's going on because it's not a it's not a task it's just a something I like to do mm. Mm. I did less drawing than I uh, meant to do uh, because I forgot how could I forget I don't know but I kind of conveniently forgot that it's very difficult well it's impossible to draw See, I bought a big roll of paper, which is down there next to it. But it's impossible, of course, to pin big rolls of paper to the wall because you've got these, which are really useful if you're hanging paintings to, to paint them. But I'm a bit of a leaner rather than a hanger. Um, and really, that's the only place, and even that's got a strut. And then what would Chris say? You know, oh, there's, a, there's a blank piece of paper. That's so good. I can't see what's going on. So, um, and last time I was here, I did some paintings, big works on paper on the floor. But that was four years ago. I'm a bit more tired now than to, to paint on the floor. It just was more difficult. So, so that's what, one of the things I didn't do. Um, I did some works on... Uh, small works on paper uh, but just trying things out, practicing sometimes I'm making works on paper before I make the paintings I mean more or less always just to kind of work it out in my head um, and I think, but I think that's all that I made this time so in a way I, I probably I achieved what I set out to achieve I'm kind of a bit astonished that it that it worked out how it worked out. <laughs> the paintings they do they do what I want them to do, but I'm not sure that they look how I expected them to look in a strange sort of way. Um, yeah, but in a way, I think. There is a thing about this space also that although in galleries the, the light is often not so good, I have this problem that if I show work um, in big uh, organisations, you know, like Tate or something like that, um, they have a sort of, in my opinion, false sense of the importance and the value of the work. And so they put very low lighting on them. So if I have paperworks, they won't light it at higher than 80 lux, which is no use to me. I've tried all kinds of arguments and discussions when I had this show at Tate um, Modern. Um, and so, in a way, a different thing happens to them in artificial light. They have a whole different character. Uh, so, w which is, is fine, but they need a lot of light. Um, so there's something marvellous about painting in this room, but to ever find, to be able to show in something as perfect is quite challenging. So kind of annoying <laughs> in a way I can moan about as much as I like but did you, you just you just don't find galleries with this kind of light in them and I think that's and not enough work's been done on electric lighting really to to help that but they they look sort of I mean I've, I've only once in seven weeks have I put these lights on and that was when I was painting 
I just wanted to finish something off, some detail-y thing, maybe at about 7.30. Which, you know, is incredible, if you think about it. It's, it's impossible anywhere else. Um, I know you all know this already, because half of you've got studios here and everybody knows it, but it still is miraculous to me. Um, I think that's probably all I've got to say uh, on my own. So if you've got any questions... Yeah. The first question is that the painting that's not here, mm. um, is that because you would have kept working on it and someone said, no, leave it alone? Or, or... No, it was the first painting I painted, um, but the person who came was a director of my gallery in New York, Green Naftali. So she came from New York, because she, which she had told me when I was there in... Uh, when was I there? February, March or something. I'm looking around the room, but I don't think there's anybody. Maybe only Chris knows that that's where I was. I can't remember. Anyway, when I was there, she said, can I take, a, because I'm painting them for her gallery, she said, could I take one uh, to Basel, to the Basel Art Fair? And I hadn't even started painting them yet. So I said, well, come really late in this period and, I, and I'll, I'll keep you updated because I didn't really know whether I might have done four, three quarters of four paintings, because I forgot to say I do often paint two paintings at once. So I'd be doing maybe, uh, I was certainly doing the um, Shell Ribbon Seller at the same time as I was doing Joseph Clark Posture Master. So I'm often doing two paintings at once and fiddling about with this and fiddling about with those. So I didn't really know whether when she came, I'd have a lot done on a lot of things, but there'd be nothing finished, so I warned her. Anyway, as I could see that I was coming along in a kind of order, so I would be painting one, then starting another, then finishing the first one, and then finishing this, as I was finishing the second one, I'd start the third one. So she came and she said, OK, now I've got to choose one. <laughs> so then it, that wasn't so easy for her. But I said, well, you can't have that one at the end because it's not finished. But you can have any of the other ones. So she just spent a long time in here and said, that's the one I want. And she'd arranged for the van to come and pick it up, even though she didn't know which one she was going to take. But they're all the same size, so it was convenient. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's why it's not here, because it's, it's gone to Basel. I had finished it, because it, it was a really early one. I didn't tell her it was the first one, but it was the first one I painted when I was down here. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, no, I couldn't... Uh... It was hard. I mean, it was really, really difficult to, to imagine one not being here, one of them not being here. But the thing is that once they're on show next year, then they'll all be back in the same place together again and then you know five weeks later they won't be but you know so it's a bit difficult but I'd said yes when I thought I can't say no <laughs> I'll know another time to say no <laughs> I, I see some pastors yes so if you use pastors maybe for details or for crushing the no, I, I use pastels to keep calm and just do something while I'm thinking or if something is a bit difficult. I quite often use charcoal. You can see here this charcoal. It's not quite fixed, probably. Um, I quite often use charcoal to draw the figures. Um, but I paint these in slightly different ways in that four of them, one, two, three, four, and the fifth one that's gone, I painted the place first. So they, I painted all of this first, and then I painted the person on top. But for some bizarre reason, which I have no idea, I did what I usually do with the last one there, and I painted the person first, and then I'm building up the place around them. But... I think it's because that posture master's kind of 
difficult, it was difficult for me to paint. I made a cutout, because I'm, I make cutouts, but not that often now, but I've made hundreds in my time. I made a, a, a cutout of Joseph Clark, the posture master, somewhere back in, oh, it must have been late 1970s, early 1980s. And I thought I'd lost this cutout, because I... I um, I sold it to somebody, I guess. I guess I sold it to him. I think I did um, for, you know, 20 quid or something. Um, and I, I, but he was a friend of a friend of a friend of somebody, and it was so long ago. And then I had this show at um, Christia Roberts, these painted, printed things that I did with Magda Stavaska. And uh, he came to this opening, and I said, oh, my God, have you still got Joseph Clark Posture Master? And he said, yes, I have. <laughs> and uh, my daughter is insisting that I leave it to her in my will. Um, so, no, you can't buy it back. <clears throat> so then I decided to paint one. But I think it's different because, um, yeah, I don't know why, really. Um, yeah. I think it's going to work eventually, but at the minute, for me, it's a bit... Ooh, a bit three quarters done, you know. So what's different? Because you painted the figure first. Yeah. So is that like really different in your brain? Yeah, because if you imagine the white canvas, and then you've got this incredible freedom to paint some kind of really intense thing, like this weird chalet and, and all these things dripping off it and this dryish paint over... You know, there's grey, and then there's lilac, and then there's pink, uh, and then there's this Payne's grey here. So there's all sorts of things you can do, and you do, that you wouldn't do if you'd already painted this, because you couldn't. You know, you sort of, you know, you want some, this to drip, you'd, you'd have to be masking off this and then getting, it's like awkward, but you can paint, you paint the background, the place, and then you kind of know who belongs in it. So, you know, this kind of funny hut thing, I don't know what it is, but it's got this kind of green back wall on top of the panes grey, and then sort of lighter grey on parchment. And, and I just wouldn't have done it in quite that way, because then I because I'd painted this place, and then I had to paint somebody who was coming really out of that place, you know, not, not in any way being sinking into it. Do you leave the, do you leave the canvas white where I like sort of paint through it a bit, where, where your figure's going to go, or, or there's no, you haven't drawn in the figure? No, nothing. I just paint the whole thing. Do you wash it down? Do you wash it down the text where the figure's going to go? No. I just paint the figure on top. That's why here, you can see this here, is paint from underneath. But what I really like when that happens is that it kind of looks like fabric, uh, accidentally. Related to that, sorry, um, they, they, where they occupy, each figure occupies the canvas is, is, is incredible, but none of them are looking out at the viewer. You avoid, no. They're avoiding, they're not confrontational at all. Is that, is that a specific well they're going about their business they're doing their thing yeah you know what i mean you 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 are important but you you can be in the painting with them you can buy something from them um but it's not like a it's not like a photograph it's not like i'm standing here for you i'm not i'm not well, i am actually standing here for you but i'm not standing here for you i'm standing here being myself being somebody, thinking something that doesn't, that doesn't have to do with you, but lots of the things that those people are thinking are things that you will all have thought. And is this normalising very much the idea of having black people in paintings in the 17th or 18th century that you were saying? Is it about introducing them, putting them back into that context and having them appear as if they're, they're, they're there? Well, those, are, those paintings, they're always there as servants, as slave servants. Um, so they're always there in relation to wealth, privilege, Europeanness. Um, these are an attempt to talk about being invisible and in plain sight. Um, 
And also, I'm often painting moments, you know, like even in here, that kind of... There are paintings that I've done moderately recently, maybe 20, 20... Yeah, 20... 20, probably, um, where there are two men in a painting. I call them pe the pastry chefs, but there are maybe five or six of these paintings where I'm very much painting a moment between two people. So the moment where you say, shall we go for a drink? And the moment in between you saying, shall we go for a drink? And that other person saying, yes or no. It's quite a moment, that. Because... Yes, because your whole life could change if they say yes or if they say no. Your entire, entire life, because that the, the not going leads to something else, or the going leads to something else. So I'm trying to, in these paintings, paint how, how all our lives are. We're saying something, we're thinking something, we're feeling something, we're doing something all at the same time. But often... In a painting, the figures are only doing one thing, looking out like a photograph taken on a birthday at an audience. And I'm like, well, well you can have one of those. You can take a photograph. I don't have anything against photographs, but I just think that people... In paintings, if you're going to paint paintings of people in the 21st century, they have to be attempting to doing something else rather than just staring at you. Can I ask you something about the... Um, it's, it's a, you're making me think very hard about colour and naturalism. That, that hand is white. It's probably the most naturalistic hand of any of the hands that you've painted. Um, the hands over there... Um, maybe because it's not finished, but you know, mm. uh, at the moment, mm. Um, mm. The, 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 the extent to which the hands are naturalistic changes. Mm. Um, I'm yeah. just, it's fascinating me, and I'd, I'd love to hear what you... Okay. Well, it's sort of unfortunate in a funny sort of way, but in lots of sorts of ways, but it's unfortunate that at the moment there isn't anyone in this room who is blacker than me. OK, which well, is not for any political reason, but for a practical reason, that because somebody has a black... Well, if you, next time you're in a room with somebody who is black, you'll see that their palms are not actually black. OK, so this isn't necessarily a white palm. It's certainly pale, but... But you, next time you look, OK? Um, yeah, it's naturalistic because it's, because it's a false thing. So you can see here that he's holding this. He's holding a stick, and the hand is on the end of the stick. So it's a false thing. So he, he's doing something about lucky charms and about selling things that are almost A, not really for sale, and B, kind of not very useful. I mean, you know, a little ribbon that big is really, it's not going to do very much for you. But he's selling very lovely things, sort of. But something else is clearly happening, which I don't know what that is. So, yeah, it, it's painting like this because it's an object. So I suppose you could say that when I'm painting objects, it's... Um, it's, in, it's fun to try to paint it a bit like it is. But when I'm painting people, like, so yeah, here, certainly these hands, well, they won't change. These probably will, but they're much more likely to be painted like that than like that. Um, these... Uh, are like this because the whole of this canvas was this colour. So I thought, three people in a green room. And now the only thing that's left of the green room is this. But there was just something about the way that that figure was, so relaxed, so sort of like, mm. I'm thinking, OK, these are like, they're staying like that. I just really like the sort of the green and the purple of it. 
and everything about it. And you kind of know what they are without me then doing anything with it. But they're not objects. They're, in a minute, they're going to move also. But, you know, every time I'm painting, I'm just trying something, always, um, to see if it works and to see if that matters. So I think I sort of feel that very much in all of them and in the bodies as well. There's a kind of... Um, I find it very hard to articulate what it is I'm feeling. But there is a movement between shape and naturalism that's happening um, in, in all of them in a different way. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, but I think it's... Um, I mean, I, I suppose I, uh, I... I've been... I suppose I've been doing this for a while, painting on canvas for a while, but, you know, when I first started... Because I trained as a theatre designer, and when I first started, I was painting on... on on wood and making wooden cutouts, which I had no real attempt to make them realistic and and photographic and human. I was talking about a sort of political uh, fact or circumstance or whatever. Um, and... Yeah, oh, so all the time I'm just trying stuff out to see if it, to see if I can do this or not do this. Um, and also, I'm a bit of an imposter in that I, I, I was never taught to paint. Like, I only really learned, learned, learned how interested I was in paint as opposed to the ideas in a painting when I came to St Ives in 98, 99, when I was trying to do, paint those skies and seas and sand as on paper as they were happening. I mean, and of course the minute you look away and you're mixing this lilac that you think you've seen, tis it is gone. But that's how I learned how to do it, which is just for two months doing that, fighting with it. It's very engaging to sense that. Mm. Yeah. Did you paint in oils ever? No, too slow for me, I think. Um, and also because no one ever taught me to paint, I think painting in oils is a whole other thing. Not so much better or worse, but it's a whole other thing. Um, that, that, uh, that sort of engagement with theatre and ballet and opera and, and fringe theatre is where I started. It, it's all about immediacy and doing things fast and then destroying them and making something else out of it and that kind of theatre of the late 1970s, early 80s, you know, um, was never about... For me, painting was never about, which is so ironic now, all these years later, making a carefully considered, measured object which would either hang in a domestic space or in a museum space. It was never, they were never about that. They were never for that. So I didn't learn f f that fr through that route. So I don't know how to do it, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and I've got time to learn. Because <laughs> I think it would take 10, 15 years to learn to do it well. Mm. So your figures are very statuesque. You've decided to equip them with poorly selling goods. Yes. Why is that? Um, Empty baskets. Yes. Yes. Um, why is that? I think because, well, you could read it that he'd sold them all, but I think his fat chickens, which is what he's selling, but he's a bit, he's kind of broken hearted. You know, he's a seller of chickens, but he has baskets with no uh, cages, with no bars. He's, yeah, he, there's something missing. There's a void. There's a, I suppose the, these things are... Yeah, 
Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know quite. Um, the people are more important than the things. Um, the things are all they have to be the people they are um, in terms of the everyday. Um, and I suppose they are, yeah, they are more than the things. Um, but I think often the, the, po the, the point of a lot of the work I make is still the same, which is to um, have some kinds of conversations with the audiences that are looking at them, who may or may, may not realise that what's happening is quite ordinary and every day and um, a lot of what's happening to audiences who are also you know curators sometimes tend to think of audiences as these kind of anonymous blob things that walk through museums or whatever never you know or, or, I think we think audiences would like this or that well actually Audiences and like lots, thousands and thousands and thousands of individual people, all of whom have rather complicated lives, even when their lives are very, from the outside, from our outside thing, very simple. It's fantastically complicated lives. And I think a lot of the time, some of what I'm doing is having secret, silent conversations with people about some of those many layers of the complications of their lives. So you, 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 would, you would think that, and that's totally true and fair, but I suspect that that juxtaposition didn't occur to someone else in this room. So e even though that's true, it's sort of true for you and not true for somebody else. Because the awful and buoyant uh, goods might take away from the, the strength of the theory. Um, mm. I don't know. There'd have to be an awful... I think, that's, I think that's a difference between the hawker, the street seller, and the shop. You know, once you start... Once you bring in a whole load of laws to get these people off the streets and put buying and selling into shops, then you go in for like the display. So then goods on display, fruit, baskets, brushes, combs, chickens, fish, become the kind of thing. And the person selling them is mm, not as important, you know. Whereas with this, you ha if you want to sell these things, you have to have a fantastic cry in the street so that, so that we buy your milk and not his milk, uh, or her milk and not hers. And you have, to pre very, you have to present yourself. You're walking through streets of other people selling stuff. And, and it's much harder work. It is, it's sort of more about you. Um, than the goods, in a way, in a different way than when we then move into the kind of shop situation. And then we move into another shop situation, you know, that kind of department store shop situation, which is thought of at the same time as the museum is thought of, where you perambulate through displays of beautifully lit goods in the kind of urban centres. So all those things are going on in my, my head as well. My obsession with shops and museums, buying and selling objects and performance um, and opera, you know. But thank you. So it's a good question. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming. It's really good. Thanks. Can we go upstairs, yeah? Yeah.